Hello and thank you so much for the organizers for putting this together. Um, I'm going to present some new work. Um, so I bit, it's a little bit preliminary, so I would really love your feedback. Um, uh, before I begin, I want to make clear that this work is the product of a collaborative effort between many people. So I want to thank my co-authors on this work, Sylvie Strella, Jackie Fulmer, an or undergrad extraordinaire, George Bajic, Alicia Sanchez Gorostiaga, Nancy Liu, and Alvaro Sanchez. And I especially want to acknowledge the immense contribution of Sylvie um, to this work. And if you saw her talk earlier today, she's awesome. And so when we think about an organism, we often isolate it for the purposes of study. And this is often very useful. But the truth is that organisms do not exist in a vacuum. They evolve in complex communities and through their ecology, physiology and development, they often modify their own environment and that of those around them. And so I don't think I need to convince anyone here that microbes often live in complex communities where they interact with each other physically and through a myriad of signals, like enzyme, of signals, enzymes, antibiotics, and many other diffusible compounds. And so in these communities, the ecology affects evolution. And then as organisms evolve, they, this can feed back and affect the ecology. And so this make it, makes it really hard to untangle the effects of ecology and the effects of evolution on sort of change over time. And it makes it hard to predict potential outcomes. But in a changing world, we would want to predict changes in community function. And so in this talk, I want to ask if there are simple metabolic rules that mediate the relationship between ecology and evolution that could serve to predict evolutionary changes, at least in these kind of simple, small communities. And so if you, went, if you were in Sylvie's talk, you'll know already some context about this experiment. But I'm taking advantage of previous work in the lab that has shown that when you isolate diverse pools of microbes from different sources and then let them assemble into a single sugar as the only carbon source, then the communities converge at least at the family level. And this is because, because there is conservation of central metabolism. And so from work we have been doing more recently, we know that glucose and similar sugars select for a predictable ratio of respirators, which are usually of the pseudomonadesi or more axolase families to fermenters, which are usually of the aeromonadesi and intrabacteriaceae. Um, and this is because fermenters can grow much faster in glucose. So initially they start growing faster and as they do, they consume the glucose available and secrete a mix of organic acids. And then respirators can take advantage of these organic acids and increase in density. We also know from previous work with E. coli that the amount of organic acids secreted depends on the growth rate. So the bacteria that we often select are some of the fastest faster growers in glucose and secrete a certain amount of organic acids per molecule of glucose. And this leads to an approximately 0.3 ratio of respirators to fermenters. And so this is the ratio that we predict from whole genome metabolic models on bacteria in these families as well. However, we could imagine that after selection in the single carbon source, fermenters might increase their growth rate. And as they do, if this relationship is a uh, relatively hard constraint, then we would expect that increased growth also leads to increased organic acid secretions. And therefore, an increase of respirators to fermenters ratio. So basically, if fermenters are becoming better at growing, but as they are becoming better at growing, they're producing more organic acids that respirers can then grow on, and so there will be more respirers. It could also be that this constraint is not as rigid and therefore bacteria are able to increase their growth rate without increasing their secretions. And so basically they're just moving this slope and this, this would mean that even though fermenters are becoming faster at growing, the ratio of um, respires to fermenters is really not changing. Now, 
I know that this is only one side of the coin and that respirators could also evolve in response affecting this respirator fermenter radio ratio. But for the interest of time in this talk, I am only going to address the fermenter side. Okay, so it, to evaluate these ideas, we perform an experiment that's similar to the ones I just described. We sample a diverse pool of microbes from soil, let it stabilize for nine transfers every 48 hours, and then from this stabilized community, we started 12 replicates and transferred them every 48 hours for up to, it was close to a year, or approximately 826 generations of bacteria. And afterwards, we isolated different colonies, sequenced these isolates, and we have found out this way that the communities are composed mostly of these taxa. Aromonas, Enterobacter, and Pantea are our main fermenters, and Acinatobacter is the respirator. And so with these isolates, we can then measure their growth rate and their, how much organic acids they secrete given the amount of glucose we give them in the media. And so when we measure the growth of these isolates and their total secretion of organic acids, in this case, we just measure acetate and lactate, which are the main organic acids they secrete um, for all the glucose provided. And sure enough, slow growing bacteria tend to secrete less organic acids. And as we can see, Enterobacter and Pantoja grow slower than the super fast Aeromonas. And so these slow genera evolved increased growth rates, but as predicted, as they evolve increased growth rate, they also increased their secretions of organic acids. Instead, we saw almost no change in the fast growing strains. At most, they got slightly slower at growing actually, and a little more efficient by decreasing secretions without much change in their growth. Um, of course, this, as I said, is preliminary data, and as you can see, some of it is a little noisy, so we need more data to be able to say for sure. But from this data, we can see that after a certain point, it's just really hard to get better at growing. And those slower strains are able to improve their growth, whereas fast growing strains do not change or get slightly worse. And so in this plot, we see the growth rate, the initial growth rate plotted against the change in growth rate over evolution. And so the ones that were growing slowly at the beginning actually increased their growth rate, whereas the aeromonas, <clears throat> which were growing much faster, had a much smaller change in growth. Okay, what was kind of puzzling about this whole thing is that despite the little change in growth rate of our monas, when I plotted the ancestral and evolved lines together, I always saw that the bulb strains on top of the ancestral ones. So always this dark blue line started growing kind of faster. And so, and I knew we had started with approximately the same density of each. So I wonder if the lag time had changed. And it, yes, it did. And so when I evaluate the change in lag time across all replicate populations, our monas saw a decrease of lag time of an average of an hour and a half. And so from this part, I hope I have convinced you that metabolic constraints reduce the space of probable evolutionary outcomes. And so slower growing strains evolved increased growth rate, but produced more organic acids. And growth rates of rapid, rapid growing strains did not evolve and are kind of constrained in this regard. Instead, these strains evolve shorter lag phases. And what's interesting is that this might be a more evolvable trait. They might be much farther from the peak in this case. And that's an in intriguing hypothesis to explore. But we wanted to see if from these evolutionary changes, we could also predict changes in community composition. And so, because we're able to distinguish the fermenter from our respir respirator taxa in this chromogenic agar that's usually used in UTI diagnosis, where we can see our fermenters 
tend to go, grow green, blue, or purplish, and our respirators tend to grow white. Um, and so we can tell them apart. And so I counted blue and white colonies and determined the respirator to fermenter ratio over time. And I know that these looks pretty noisy and kind of ugly, um, but we do not see a big difference in ratio over time. And if something, there's a slight decline, decline in res respirators to fermenters. But nevertheless, the final ratio of respirators to fermenters strongly correlates with the mean concentration of organic acid secreted by all the fermenters in that community. And so if I look at the Enterobacter and Aromonas um, secretions in a certain community and I average those out, those actually predict the ratio of respire to fermenters. And so can simple metabolic rules predict evolutionary change in simple communities? Well, maybe metabolic rules, at least the ones we have here are not enough to predict completely the outcomes, but they reduce the options and help us make more educated guesses. And so in this case, knowing the initial growth rate and the relationship between growth rate and organic acid secretion can take us a long way into predicting the potential evolutionary outcomes and how they might affect community composition. And so with that, I would like to thank my funding from the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies, the Sanchez Lab at Yale, the organizers of the conference, everyone here, and as it's been said, <laughs> I will be joining um, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Irvine. And so please, if you're interested in sort of how metabolism mediates eco-evolutionary feedbacks in microbial communities and micro-plant interactions, um, please get in contact and join the Commons Lab at UCI. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for that. I was uh, thinking about how this relates to uh, the evolution in the communities that uh, Jonathan Friedman was sharing earlier. Um, and, and it seemed like he, he was finding really repeatable results. And it seemed, looked like you had really strong uh, similarity between replicates as well. Yes. And do you have thoughts on, I mean, did that surprise you? Or, is, or do you have thoughts on why it was so repeatable? And yeah, I mean, I think there's is, I think what's cool is these sort of overall rules seem to predict the patterns and everyone seems to behave according to these patterns. So I think the, there's simple rules that are predicting the overall dynamics. I still think, and, and that's where I want just to get more replicates and get slightly noisy, less noisy um, data, because I think there is a still interesting variation between replicates and especially we haven't isolated um, enterobacter from all so our monas is the dominant fermenter and that's in all the replicate populations but we haven't isolated enterobacter from all of them and i wonder if just that initial sampling kind of changes the dynamics. And because enterobacter are actually the ones that are increasing their organic acid secretions, that might lead to this sort of overall relationship with the ratio does change between communities just a tiny bit. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, and Shrada Shitu asks, uh, says, nice talk. I was wondering how far the predictability goes considering there will be changes in metabolic activities of cells over time, at least longer time scales. Yeah, so one thing I'm really interesting, interested in is to what extent, like how hard are these constraints? And by hard versus soft constraints, I mean, how easy is to evolve a way out of these constraints? And so how, it, how and so I think in short time scales like the ones we have here, your metabolism is only changing along that line but maybe if you push long enough, you can start pushing that line, but that requires a sort of reorganization of your proteome allocation and things that might be slightly trickier to evolve. Um, 
Uh, great. And then there's also a question about whether you've competed the ancestral and evolved fermenter strains where only the lag phase changed. Um, so we haven't done that yet. That's one of the things we're doing now. Um, so those measures, we're measuring them separately. Um, and I'm interested to see how much of a difference that lag change makes. Yeah. Excellent.